Hey, 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 Laura J. At the end of my workout today, stretching in the yard, hair's a little messy. Bath tonight, 5.22 p.m. when I finish the movement and listening of the artist's ways chapter on recovering a sense of compassion, which I break down to be compounded passion which you can take, you can leave, you can work with, decide how it sits and fits for you as I hope you will do with this message too. Share it with a friend who would benefit from having some support in unblocking the artist within them just as you do. So you have a friend to go on the journey inward with. Peaceful Inner Warriors United is an initiative to ensure that you have support and the flies represent the abundance of ideas that are available to us all in this age of information where we are called to discern what things mean to and for us and then what we will do with them because that is when they actually become as powerful as what they could be if we used them and put them into practice living them for it is lived backwards that spells devil and instead of that let us shovel it to the side and actually reorder ourselves and the way that we choose to use the information that would either put us into someone else's formation or help us blaze the path that others will follow one day because in fact we walked it we lived it and we came back with tales to sh tell about the journey and actually fully committed the sacred sojourn of now is the book that talks about that in chapter which chapter talks about the sacred sojourn of the soul chapter 20 on page 121 is true i just found it for you and i hope that you will get your own copy when it comes in later on in august so let me know if you'd like to be on that list make sure that you subscribe to the list that i send emails regularly and you can let me know whether you want a signed copy shipped to you or to come out live when i do a book signing and reading and all the things that i'm working to put together to make it that much more fun for us to go on a journey inward together with some songs freestyled because i don't generally write down what i will sing except i wrote that down and may read it as a song if you would like me to carry on with that let me know for now i'm gonna go oh wait i am replacing this to put it in the beginning and so instead of listening at the end i hope you enjoy this now and chapter reading to please move with me back then as i read it in the now when we are both in it now because now's all we've got have you ever been in a not now moment only in your mind recovering a sense of compassion this week finds us facing the internal blocks to creativity it may be tempting to abandon ship at this point don't. We will explore and acknowledge the emotional difficulties that beset us in the past as we made creative efforts. We will undertake healing the shame of past failures. We will gain in compassion as we reparent the frightened artist child who yearns for creative accomplishment. We will learn tools to dismantle emotional blocks and support renewed risk. Fear. One of the most important tasks in artistic recovery is learning to call things or and ourselves by the right names. Most of us have spent years using the wrong names for our behaviors. We have wanted to create, and we have been unable to create, and we have called that inability laziness. This is not merely inaccurate. It is cruel. Accuracy and compassion serve us far better. Blocked artists are not lazy. They're blocked. Being blocked and being lazy are two different things. The blocked artist typically expends a great deal of energy, just not visibly. The blocked artist spends energy on self-hatred, on regret, on grief, and on jealousy. The blocked artist spends energy on self-doubt. The blocked artist does not know how to begin with baby steps. Instead, the blocked artist thinks in terms of great, big, scary, impossible tasks. 
a novel, a feature film, a one-person show, an opera. When these large tasks are not accomplished or even begun, the blocked artist calls that laziness. Do not call the inability to start laziness. Call it fear. Fear is the true name for what ails the blocked artist. It may be fear of failure or fear of success. Most frequently, it is fear of abandonment. This fear has roots in childhood reality. Most blocked artists try to become artists against either their parents' good wishes or their parents' good judgment. For a youngster, this is quite a conflict. To go squarely against your parents' values means you better know what you're doing. You better not just be an artist. You better be a great artist if you're going to hurt your parents so much. Parents do act hurt when children rebel, and declaring oneself an artist is usually viewed by parents as an act of rebellion. Unfortunately, the view of an artist's life as an adolescent rebellion often lingers, making any act of art entail the risk of separation and the loss of loved ones. Because artists still yearn for their creative goals, they then feel guilty. This guilt demands that they set a goal for themselves right off the bat, that they must be great artists in order to justify this rebellion. The need to be a great artist makes it hard to be an artist. The need to produce a great work of art makes it hard to produce any art at all. Finding it hard to begin a project does not mean you will never be able to do it. It means you will need help from your higher power, from supportive friends, and from yourself. First of all, you must give yourself permission to begin small and go in baby steps. These steps must be rewarded. Setting impossible goals creates enormous fear, which creates procrastination, which we wrongly call laziness. Do not call procrastination laziness. Call it fear. Fear is what blocks an artist. The fear of not being good enough, the fear of not finishing, the fear of failure and of success, fear of beginning at all. There is only one cure for fear. That cure is love. Use love for your artist to cure its fear. Stop yelling at yourself. Be nice. Call fear by its right name. Enthusiasm. It must take so much discipline to be an artist. We are often told by well-meaning people who are not artists but wish they were. What a temptation. What a seduction. They're inviting us to preen before an admiring audience, to act out the image that is so heroic and spartan and false. As artists, grounding our self-image in military discipline is dangerous. In the short term, discipline may work, but it will work only for a while. By its very nature, discipline is rooted in self-admiration. Think of discipline as a battery, useful but short-lived. We admire ourselves for being so wonderful. The discipline itself, not the creative outflow, becomes the point. That part of us that creates best is not a driven, disciplined automaton, functioning from willpower with a booster of pride to back it up. This is operating out of self-will. You know the image, rising at dawn with military precision, saluting the desk, the easel, the drawing board. Over an extended period of time, being an artist requires enthusiasm more than discipline. Enthusiasm is not an emotional state. It is a spiritual commitment, a loving surrender to our creative process, a loving recognition of all the creativity around us. Enthusiasm from the Greek, filled with God, is an ongoing energy supply tapped into the flow of life itself. Enthusiasm is grounded in play, not work. Far from being a brain-numbed soldier, our artist is actually our child within, our inner playmate. As with all playmates, it is joy, not duty, that makes for a lasting bond. True, our artist may rise at dawn to greet the typewriter or easel in the morning stillness, but this event has more to do with a child's love of secret adventure than of ironclad discipline. What other people may view as discipline is actually a play date that we make with our artist child. I'll meet you at 6 a.m. and we'll goof around with that script, painting, sculpture. Our artist child can best be enticed to work by treating work as play. Paint is great gooey stuff. 60 sharpened pencils are fun. Many writers eschew a computer from, for the comforting, companionable clatter for a solid typewriter that trots along like a pony. In order to work well, many artists find that their work spaces are best dealt with as play spaces. Dinosaur murals, toys with the five and dime, tiny miniature Christmas lights, paper mache monsters, hanging crystals, a sprig of flowers, a fish tank. As attractive as the idea of a pristine cell, monastic in its severity, is to our romanticized notion of being a real artist, the workable truth may be somewhat messier than that. Most little kids would be bored silly in a stark barren room. Our artist child is no exception. Remember that art is process. The process is supposed to be fun. For our purposes, the journey is always the only arrival, may be interpreted to mean that our creative work is actually our creativity itself at play in the field of time. At the heart of this play is the mystery of joy. Creative U-turns. Recovering from artist's block, like recovering from any major illness or injury, requires a commitment to health. 
At some point, we must make an active choice to relinquish the joys and privileges accorded to the emotional invalid. The productive artist is quite often a happy person. This can be very threatening as a self-concept to those who are used to getting their needs met by being unhappy. I'd love to see, but you see, I have these crippling fears it can get us a lot of attention. We get more sympathy as crippled artists than as functional ones. Those of us addicted to sympathy in the place of creativity can become increasingly threatened as we become increasingly functional. Many recovering artists become so threatened that they make U-turns and sabotage themselves. We usually commit creative harakiri either on the eve of or in the wake of a cre first creative victory. The glare of success, a poem, an acting job, a song, a short story, a film, or any success can send the recovering artist scurrying back into the cave of self-defeat. We're more comfortable being a victim of artist's block than risking having to consistently be productive and healthy. An artistic U-turn arrives on a sudden wave of indifference. We greet our newly minted product or our delightful process with, ah, uh, what does it matter anyway? It's just a start. Everybody else is so much further ahead. Yes, and they will stay that way if we stop working. The point is, we have traveled light years from where we were when we were blocked. We are now on the road, and the road is scary. We begin to be distracted by roadside distractions or detoured by the bumps. A screenwriter has an agent interested in repping a script with just a few changes. He doesn't make the changes. A performance artist is offered a space to use for workshopping his new material. He does it once, doesn't like his mixed reception, indicating more work is needed, then stops working on new material at all. An actor is told to get his headshots together and check back in with a prestigious agent. He doesn't get his headshots, doesn't check back in. An actress producer with a solid script is offered a studio deal to further develop her project. She finds fault with the deal and then shelves the project entirely. A painter is invited into a group show, his first, but picks a fight with the gallery owner. A poet reads some poems to very good public reception at a neighborhood open mic. Instead of continuing at this level and gaining strength, the poet enters a slam, a sort of boxing match for poets judged by non-poets, loses and stops reading publicly altogether. A lyricist hooks up with a new composer and they literally make beautiful music together. They demo three songs, which get enthusiastic response and then stop working together. A fledgling photographer is greatly encouraged by her teacher's interest in her work. She botches developing one roll of film and then quits the class, claiming it was boring. In dealing with our creative U-turns, we must first of all extend ourselves some sympathy. Creativity is scary, and in all careers there are U-turns. Sometimes these U-turns are best viewed as recycling times. We come up to a creative jump, run out from it like a skittish horse, then circle the field a few times before trying the fence again. Typically, when we take a creative U-turn, we are doubly shamed, first by our fear and second by our reaction to it. Again, let me say, it helps to remember that all careers have them. For two years in my mid-30s, I wrote arts coverage for the Chicago Tribune. In this capacity, I talked to Akira Kurosawa, Kevin Klein, Julie Andrews, Jane Fonda, Blake Edwards, Sidney Pollack, Sissy Spacek, Sigourney Weaver, Martin Ritt, Gregory Hines, and 50-odd more. I talked to most of them about discouragement, which meant talking to them about U-turns. As much as talent, the capacity to avoid or recoup from creative U-turns distinguished their careers. A successful creative career is always built on successful creative failures. The trick is to survive them. It helps to remember that even our most illustrious artists have taken creative U-turns in their time. Blake Edwards has directed some of the funniest and most successful comedies of the past three decades. Nonetheless, he spent seven years in self-imposed exile in Switzerland because a script that he felt was his best was taken away from him in pre-production when his take on the material differed from that of the star the studio had acquired to enhance it. Fired from his own project, Edward sat on the sidelines, watching as his beloved film was made by others and botched badly. Like a wounded pa panther, Edwards retired to the Alps to nurse his wounds. He wound up back directing seven long years later, when he concluded that creativity, not time, would best heal his creative wounds. Sticking to this philosophy, he has been aggressively productive ever since. Talking about time out to me, he was rueful and pained about the time it cost him. Have compassion. Creative U-turns are always born from fear, fear of success or fear of failure. It doesn't really matter which. The net result is the same. To recover from a creative U-turn or a pattern involving many creative U-turns, we must first admit that it exists. Yes, I did react negatively to fear and pain. Yes, I do need help. Think of your talent as a young and skittish horse that you are bringing along. This horse is very talented, but it is also young, nervous, and inexperienced. It will make mistakes, be frightened by obstacles it hasn't seen before. It may even bolt, try to throw you off, feign lameness. Your job as the creative jockey is to keep your horse moving forward and to coax it into finishing the course. 
First of all, take a look at what jumps make your horse so skittish. You may find that certain obstacles are far more scary than others. An agent jump may frighten you more than a workshop jump. A review jump may be okay while a rewrite jump scares your talent to death. Remember that in a horse race, there are other horses in the field. One trick a seasoned jockey uses is to place a green horse in the slipstream of an older, steadier, and more seasoned horse. You can do this too. Who do I know who has an agent? Then ask them how they got one. Who do I know who has done a successful rewrite? Ask them how to do one. Do I know anyone who has survived a savage review? Ask them what they did to heal themselves. Once we admit the need for help, the help arrives. The ego always wants to claim self-sufficiency. It would rather pose as a creative loner than ask for help. Ask anyway. Bob was a promising young director when he made his first documentary. It was a short, very powerful film about his father, a factory worker. When he had a rough cut together, Bob showed it to a teacher, a once gifted filmmaker who was blocked himself. The teacher savaged it. Bob abandoned the film. He stuck the film in some boxes, stuck the boxes in his basement, and forgot about them until the basement flooded. Oh well, just as well, he told himself then, assuming the film was ruined. I met Bob a half decade later. Sometime after we became friends, he told me the story of his film. I had a suspicion that it was good. It's lost, he told me. Even the lab lost the footage I gave them. Talking about the film, Bob broke down and threw. He began to mourn his abandoned dream. A week later, Bob got a call from the lab. It's incredible. They found the footage, he related. I was not too surprised. I believe the creator keeps an eye on artists and was protecting that film. With the encouragement of his screenwriter girlfriend, now his wife, Bob finished his film. They have gone on to make a second innovative documentary together. Faced with a creative U-turn, ask yourself, who can I ask for help about this U-turn? Then start asking. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage, Anais Nin. Man is not free to refuse to do the thing which gives him more pleasure than any other conceivable action, Stendhal. Art evokes the mystery without which the world would not exist, Rene Francois Ghislaine Margaret. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, Duke Ellington and Irving Mills. Lasting through blocks. In order to work freely on a project, an artist must be at least functionally free of resentment, anger, and resistance, fear. What do we mean by that? We mean that any buried barriers must be aired before the work can proceed. The same holds true for any buried payoffs to not working. Locks are seldom mysterious. They are instead recognizable artistic defenses against what is perceived, rightly or wrongly, as a hostile environment. Remember, your artist is a creative child. It sulks, throws tantrums, holds grudges, harbors irrational fears. Like most children, it is afraid of the dark, the boogeyman, and any adventure that isn't sa safely scary. As your artist's parent and guardian, its big brother, warrior, and champion, it falls to you to convince your artist it is safe to come out and work, play. Beginning any new project, it's a good idea to ask your artist a few simple questions. These questions will help remove common bugaboos standing between your artist and the work. These same questions asked when work grows difficult or bogs down usually act to clear the obstructed flow. One, list any resentments, anger, you have in connection with this project. It does not matter how petty, picky, or irrational these resentments may appear to your adult self. To your artist child, they are real big deals, grudges. Some examples, I resent being the second artist asked, not the first. I am too the best. I resent this editor. She just nitpicks. She never says anything nice. I resent doing work for this idiot. He never pays me on time. Two, ask your artist to list any and all fears about the projected piece of work and or anyone connected to it. Again, these fears can be as dumb as any two-year-olds. It does not matter that they are groundless to your adult size. What matters is that they are big, scary monsters to your artist. Some examples, I'm afraid the work will be rotten and I won't know it. I'm afraid the work will be good and they won't know it. I'm afraid all my ideas are hackneyed and outdated. I'm afraid my ideas are ahead of their time. I'm afraid I'll starve. I'm afraid I'll never finish. I'm afraid I'll never start. I'm afraid I'll be embarrassed. I'm already embarrassed. The list goes on. Three, ask yourself if that is all. Have you left out any itsy fear? Have you suppressed any stupid anger? Get it out on the page. Four, ask yourself what you stand to gain by not doing this piece of work. Some examples, if I don't write the piece, no one can hate it. If I don't write the piece, my jerk editor will worry. If I don't paint, sculpt, act, sing, dance, I can criticize others knowing I could do it better. Five, make your deal. The deal is, okay, creative force, you take care of the quality. I'll take care of the quantity. Sign your deal and post it. A word of warning. This is a very powerful exercise. It can do fatal damage to a creative block. Music is your own experience, your thoughts, your wisdom. 
if you don't live it out, it won't come out your horn. Charlie Parker. Be really whole and all things will come to you. Lao Tzu. Learning is movement from moment to moment. Jay Krishnamurti. Tasks. One, read your morning pages. This process is best undertaken with two colored markers. One to highlight insights and another to highlight actions needed. Do not judge your pages or yourself. This is very important. Yes, they will be boring. Yes, they may be painful. Consider them a map. Take them as information, not as indictment. Take stock. Who have you consistently been complaining about? What have you procrastinated on? What blessedly have you allowed yourself to change or accept? Take heart. Many of us notice an alarming tendency toward black and white thinking. He's terrible. He's wonderful. I love him. I hate him. It's a great job. It's a terrible job and so forth. Don't be thrown by this. Acknowledge. The pages have allowed us to vent without self-destruction, to plan without interference, to complain without an audience, to dream without restriction, to know our own minds. Give yourself credit for undertaking them. Give them credit for the changes and growth they have fostered. Two, visualizing. You have already done work with naming your goal and identifying true north. The following exercise asks you to fully imagine having your goal accomplished. Please spend enough time to fill in the juicy details that would really make the experience wonderful for you. Name your goal. I am, in the present tense, describe yourself doing it at the height of your powers. This is your real theme. Read this aloud to yourself. Post this above your work area. Read this aloud daily. For the next week, collect actual pictures of yourself and combine them with magazine images to collage your ideal scene described above. Remember, seeing is believing, and the added visual cue of your real self in your ideal scene can make it far more real. Three, priorities. List for yourself your creative goals for the year. List for yourself your creative goals for the month. List for yourself your creative goals for the week. Four, creative U-turns. All of us have taken creative U-turns. Name one of yours. Name three more. Name the one that just kills you. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for all failures of nerve, timing, and initiative. Devise a personalized list of affirmations to help you do better in the future. Very gently, very gently. Consider whether any aborted, abandoned, savaged, or sabotaged brain children can be rescued. Remember, you are not alone. All of us have taken creative U-turns. Choose one creative U-turn. Retrieve it. Bend it. Do not take a creative U-turn now. Instead, notice your resistance. Morning pages seeming difficult stupid, pointless, too obvious, do them anyway. What creative dreams are lurching toward possibility? Admit that they frighten you. Choose an artist totem. It might be a doll, a stuffed animal, a carved figurine, or a wind-up toy. The point is to choose something you immediately feel a protective fondness toward. Give your totem a place to honor and then honor it by not beating up your artist child. Check in. One. How many days this week did you do your morning pages? Regarding your U-turns, have you allowed yourself a shift toward compassion, at least on the page? Two, did you do your artist date this week? Have you kept the emphasis on fun? What did you do? How did it feel? Three, did you experience any synchronicity this week? What was it? Four, were there any other issues this week that you consider significant for your recovery? Describe them. We learn to do something by doing it. There is no other way. John Holt, educator. And that is the chapter on compassion today. May you live in a way will be proud of yourself and others can respect and reflect on the life you lived and say hey they were great because they're grateful in the moment that we're in i'm grateful for you thank you Laura Day, namaste, nama go for today it's true i wish you well and hope you enjoyed this chapter.